Good morning, Internet. Today we're building a computer. There's the CPU, here's the motherboard, we've got a heat sink and fan, we've got some thermal grease, a video card, uh, what else we have? Ooh, nuts and bolts, some SATA cables, instruction manual on my tablet, screwdriver, a hard drive, uh, power supply, some water so my throat doesn't get parched, and a case. A perfectly clean and useful case. It's perfectly clean at... Ew. Let's clean this. So, most people use canned air to clean computer cases. <laughs> doesn't work too bad, right? I'm not most people. I actually have my own air, uh, air compressor. Yay, air. <laughs> oh, yeah! so much easier and, well, other than the dust that kicks up. So, now that we've cleaned out the case, well, there's still some stuff stuck to it. You see, this case was actually not brand new. The computer that I'm building is actually an older computer. I figure, you know, might not be a terrible idea to just reuse parts, not to mention I am lay poor at the moment, so I'm cleaning this computer out. Uh, the case is from one of my friends, the motherboard and CPU are from another one of my friends, some of these parts are mine, it's a franking case. So you'll want to make sure that whatever case that you use is cleaned out, whether it's manually cleaning or, well, it's a brand new case, so probably not that useful. I think somebody must have spilled something in here, I mean, just look at how dirty the bottom is. Ew. Make sure it's dry as well, I mean, water is bad after all. Um, I mean, cases are just pieces of metal or pieces of plastic usually. It's not really that big of a deal if they get wet. There's not too many components inside, but, well, it's usually better to just keep things dry. A key part in assembling a case are motherboard standoffs. They're small pieces of metal, as you can see right there. They are useful for making sure the motherboard doesn't short out on the case. Usually you'll have a half dozen or a dozen of them. You screw them in based off of what well, where the holes are on the motherboard. It's pretty obvious when you see put in the motherboard. This case already had them there, so I don't need to worry about it. From here, we're going to install this incredibly obnoxious piece of metal. This is an I.O. shield. Looks like that. Basic idea is that it goes in there. It covers up so you don't have a whole bunch of dust coming out or things like that. It's also a royal pain to actually install. I cannot emphasize this enough. There's a reason why I'm speeding up these recordings from time to time. It's because of how long it takes to actually do this. I'll put the stats for how long each step took at the end of the video so you can see what's going on and such. In this video, I'm actually going to install the CPU next. Yes, that is actually what your processor looks like in a computer. Small piece of metal, very large number of holes on the bottom. See, you can even see it up close. Usually I install this after the motherboard is in the case, but recording it, it, you wouldn't be able to see anything. So I'm actually going to install this with my hands. Please don't do this at home. To place most modern CPUs, or at least Intel ones, what you do is you align the CPU up with the socket. There's a little arrow that you can't see in the top right hand corner, and you basically just drop it in the socket. Here, I'll show you that again, just in case you didn't get it. So, there's the socket, there's a very large number of pins, in this case 1,366 pins. You just drop the CPU in, and then, well, make sure it doesn't move around or anything like that. Fold over the little cover, then there's this little peg thing that clamps down on the CPU, it takes a lot of force, and that's it. Next we have the actual motherboard installation. This can take a few attempts because some cases are really small, doesn't really fit in very well. Basically you just angle the motherboard in, Watch out for random pieces of metal that like to stab you. This is usually where computers take their blood sacrifices when you build them. Place it in, align everything, and if everything goes right and you don't accidentally hide something behind the motherboard, it should just fall into place. Great. Now that's done, you need to just screw in the motherboard. There are a lot of screws on motherboards. It depends on the size for exactly how many, and also the case. Some cases have a central peg that you don't have to screw in. In this case, it's a full-size ATX motherboard, so there are basically screws around the entire outside edge, three on each side, and one in the middle. Just screw in. It's a standard Phillips head screw. Normal-sized screwdrivers typically work just fine. Aren't you glad we can just fast-forward through this? This would just take way too long. 
Now we get to installing the heat sink and fan. No, this is not heroin, do not inject it. Heroin's bad kids, don't do it. This is thermal grease. In this case, this is a syringe of thermal grease. All you do is unscrew the syringe and then squeeze a pea size amount of thermal grease onto here. Emphasis on pea sized If you squeeze out too much, it starts acting as an insulator. All you do is little dollop there in the exact center of the CPU, and then when you install the heatsink, it squeezes it in a roughly even manner. That's all you need it for. You're just trying to fill in the air gap. From here, we install the heatsink. You grab the heatsink. It's a giant mass of metal. So you just grab it, align the four pins on each side. You, it's kind of hard to see. Unfortunately, there's not really an angle for me to do this in. Align the four pins on each side with the holes, and then go ahead and push the pins in. Intel heat sinks are royal pains. This takes a lot of effort, and actually for some motherboards, you'll actually see the motherboard bend. It's putting so much strength. This heat sink, unfortunately, is actually slightly broken, so I didn't show the part where I had to go fiddle around with it for five minutes afterward just to make it align correctly. Now on to RAM. RAM is actually really easy to install. You can't actually really screw it up unless if you just don't do it. RAM kind of looks like this. This has a heat sink. There's a larger part. There's a smaller part. All you have to do is make sure it's aligned to the motherboard. There's also a larger part and smaller part. Look in your motherboard's manual for where you should be pushing, putting the RAM. That's why it looks a little strange for how I'm installing it here. Also, one of the slots is slightly broken on this motherboard, so I had to be a little careful. All you have to do is put pressure until it clicks and the little arms on each side will hold the RAM in place. If they don't push in, you do not have a stick of RAM in place. While we're at it, let's plug the CPU fan in because I forgot to do this earlier. It's between the CPU and the RAM. Done. From here, let's go ahead and install the video card. This video card actually has a replacement fan and heat sink on top of it. That's the reason why it looks a little weird and has an extra wire coming out. So we have to plug in that fan into the motherboard manually. There's a couple of places on this motherboard that this video card fits in. Use the top one. It's generally better on most motherboards. I can go into detail as to why, but not really needed. Put it, push gently on the top until it clicks in. Make sure, in this case, I have a fan that I needed to go plug in, so I go ahead and plug in the fan. Also, screw in the video card, that way you can make sure that everything is going to stay exactly where it is. You don't want things bouncing around, you don't want a video card falling out or anything like that. That would be bad. On to installing the hard drive! This computer is actually not going to have a hard drive, so I'm just using this hard drive as an example. It's actually a dead hard drive. There is two ports on the back of the hard drive. One is for power, one is for data. There's screws along each side of the hard drive. That way we can screw it in. To do this, you'll want to find a three and a half inch bay. Usually there's multiple of them in a case. Unless if you're dealing with a small one, there's typically five or six. Just slide it in. You'll want to align the screw holes with the hard drive. In this case, there's little rubber grommets in order to noise dampen things. Hard drives spin at a few thousand revolutions per minute, so you'll want to make sure that it's not making a whole bunch of noise by vibrating. There's typically screws on both sides of the hard drive. In this case's case, it's extremely difficult to actually reach the screws on the back side. So since this is actually just me showing you what it looks like and how to do it that way, I'm just not going to bother screwing it in. It's definitely screw it in if you're using a hard drive into a computer. This is the same general directions for what you would do with an SSD, only usually you would need an adapter in order to fit into that three and a half inch bay. It's really about it. It's not very difficult. Now for the DVD burner. This is actually a very similar process to a hard drive. In fact, it looks very similar. There's four screws on each side rather than three, just two top, two bottom, and it slides into a five and a quarter inch bay. There's two ports on the back of the DVD burner, just like a hard drive, one's for power, one's for data. This computer actually doesn't need a DVD burner, but since the case already has a hole in it and I would prefer not to have even more dust infection points, for lack of a better term, I am going to go ahead and throw it in here anyway. Take special care when you slide this in. It can, in fact, go in too far. It can come out too far. It doesn't really have an effect on what it does. It's just ugly. Yeah, this actually takes me quite a while to do, doesn't it? And my camera work was not very good on this. It does not help that I'm trying to use my tripod at the same time as installing things into a computer case. 
There's small screws that go on each side, and yes, I am screwing in both sides because this one's not quite as terrible as the other one. Some people like installing power supplies ahead of time before you even put the motherboard in. I don't. Power supplies are annoying things that have lots of tangly cords, and, well, they would just get in the way of everything else anyway. So, power supplies, every case is different as to how you have to install power supplies. They're not even regularly in the same place. In this case, this case goes into the top. So what I'm doing is I'm aligning the cords that definitely have to go down through holes in, and then sliding the power supply in through the top. Afterwards, there's four normal sized screws on the back. Once they're in there, the power supply is secure, and there's not really anything else to do for the actual physical install of the power supply. Just lots of cable work. Mmm, cables. Cabling work is, well, tedious, but I like it. I like making things that all look neat and simple so things don't get in the way. You'll want to make sure everything's plugged in first. The wide, long, wide cable plugs into the motherboard for general motherboard and computer power. There's also a smaller cable that plugs in closer to the CPU. This is for additional power specifically for the CPU. I actually plug in the wrong cable in this. Unfortunately, this motherboard has a different port style than what the power supply normally handles, so it doesn't quite look right even when it's correct. I'll correct this later on in the video. At this point, you would also normally want to plug in the video card. That's something that I forgot to do. Some video cards require external power. This is one of them. I correct it later on. Yeah. There's also plugging in the fan's power. You'll want to make sure that you have the correct port. Some case fans actually plug in directly into the motherboard. This is not one of those. This one just plugs into a standard what's called a 4-pin Molex. It's a plastic and nectar that has four pins in it. It's not very difficult. We're not we're not doing rocket science tree here, folks. Some cases actually have ways of handling cables. This, well, this isn't one of them. Instead, I have Velcro wire ties. I love Velcro wire ties for cable management. Um, some people prefer plastic wire ties. Those are a little more permanent to my taste. These are cheap enough where I just use them by the dozens. There's all I do is wrap up cables. I try to find some place to wrap it. In this case's case, there's actually a little metal bar that I'm attaching this to. Just wrap around cables that you don't need. That way they're not hanging in the way and potentially getting into fans or just looking ugly. It's not too difficult. We also need to install the SATA power cable. They look like little black weird connectors. These are very delicate, fair warning. I have cracked many, many different power cables. I've also cracked the hard drive side. There's a few other cables in here as well. You may or may not need them depending on your computer setup. Again, this is not really meant to be a how-to, this is more of a demonstration than anything. I end up plugging in both the hard drive and the DVD drive with different cables. That's normal if you have many extra power cables. We're not actually going to use the hard drive here, so I unplug it a little bit later, but this should give you an idea as to what it looks like and how much force you need and so on. Make sure you hide power cables whenever possible. If there was proper cable management in this case, I would recommend that you use said cable management. There isn't. Don't worry about it. From here, all I do is basically hide the rest of the cables and wrap them up so they don't get in the way. There's a gap behind the power supply, basically between the power supply and the optical drive. This is the perfect spot to hide things. It's not going to get in any fans or anything like that. You'll want to fold them up with the natural folds of the power supply. Some people have nicer power supplies that you can actually just remove the cables from. I highly recommend purchasing such a modular power supply if you have the choice. Most people don't. Do what you can. Use lots and lots of Velcro, and you can see just how long this has taken with how fast I have sped up this video. While I have to talk for quite some time because Sony Vegas can't actually speed up the video anymore, might as well talk about what this computer is that I'm actually building. This is a role-playing computer. We use it for Google Hangouts to be able to have people remotely play any of our role-playing games. We could probably use it for board gaming as well, but we don't. Unfortunately, Google Hangouts actually requires a pretty high CPU spec. It's actually requiring a quad-core processor, which I did not have. This is actually a higher-end processor in this case than in my gaming computer. This was just donated to the group by one of my friends, so I'm not going to swap my personal power supply. 
power supply. CPU, I can speak gooder, I swear. I'm really just trying to fill up time here. La 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 la, I like kitties. And done. Sweet, there we go. From here, we're now plugging in the front panel of the case. You'll definitely want your motherboard manual for this. On one of the pages, you will should have a diagram something like this. This shows you exactly what pins need to be plugged into what cables. This is by far the most annoying part of a computer build. I really wish motherboard and case manufacturers would finally decide on a standard so I wouldn't have to do this anymore. This I've been having to do this since the ATX standard came out, and that would be in the mid-90s. Uh, you can't even see how tiny these things are very well. That's the reason why I have to move the camera around, so you can actually see what's going on. Oh, no! Earthquake! No, I'm just taking it out of the tripod. So, underneath all of these cables, there's little... Uh, in this motherboard's case, they're actually color-coded, which is awesome. The little pins down there. That is actually what I'm going to be plugging these into. There's also USB cords and things like that. I'll plug them in at the same time. Basically, everything that's on the front panel of this case. On most cases, there's also microphone and headphone. There is not in this case, so I don't plug anything into there. And we're back on the tripod. Good. So let me rotate this case around a bit so we can actually see what we're doing. I hope this is going to be good enough. Uh, well, that's about the best I'm going to get, because I can't hold this myself. I'm going to go ahead and plug in the USB port first, because that's the easy one. It's, in this case's case, the thick cable. There's a spot on the motherboard, it's even labeled USB in big letters, so I can actually plug it in. The cable only goes in one way. There's actually two spots on the motherboard, because the motherboard is meant to handle multiple front-facing USB ports. This computer only has two, so... It's not actually needed. There. Should be plugged in now. Now let's fast forward through plugging in all of these tiny little things. This includes the speaker for CPU noises. Computers don't really use this anymore. Also, reset switch, power switch, power LED, and there's another LED as well that most people don't actually use. Yeah, this actually takes me quite some time usually. This is my record for how fast I've done this, and that's not including it sped up. Still, Sony Vegas can't speed this up anymore. Oh, I did, 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 there's not really much to them. They can be plugged in both directions. There's two different types of connectors in this case. There's standard connectors that are straight and right angle connectors. It's really just a matter of which one makes sense for which situation. I don't know why I just made that handshake. Oh well. I'm going to plug them in. There's not really much to show in this case, so I'm going to go ahead and speed this up. Also, I'm not going to bother plugging in the hard drive because, well, it's just going out immediately after this anyway. And done. All that's left at this point is to go ahead and put the case back on, or the side panel of the case back on, I should say. This case actually doesn't have any other panels. I don't know where they are. It's not mine originally. So, we're done, right? I mean, there's nothing else left? Nothing at all? Wait, why is there a black screen here? What's going on? I don't understand! Oh, right. I messed up this build and recorded how I fixed it. Right here. You see, whenever you build a computer, there is always SOMETHING that messes up. I very rarely have a computer that actually works right on the first try. In this case, I plugged the wrong power cables in the wrong spots. So, this actually fits in both locations. This cable is actually meant to be on the video card, that way there's enough power for the graphics card to be able to do anything whatsoever. And there's a second cable here that actually needs to plug into the motherboard over by where the CPU is at. That's about it. Uh, the computer actually works perfectly fine after this, so I'm actually running it right now and installing Linux. Hooray! I hope you all enjoyed this video. Uh, the stats are visible right now for how long this actually took me. Uh, the video itself is going to only be exactly 20 minutes long. Enjoy, Internet. I will see you all tomorrow, even though you have barely seen any of me today. And the editing only took me three hours! Woo! Oh.